field and he kicked daddy's gas mask off and uh, it was mustard gas and that burned you and this friend died and then daddy was in the hospital for months he couldn't talk he said they called him the whispering hope and uh, so he before that, he could lead singing real good at church, but after that, he never could hardly get a squawk out singing. But um, So Daddy never could breathe or anything real good, and he was in the hospital in France, and they come through and said, if any of y'all will sign that you're well, you can go home. Well, he jumped at the chance. If he hadn't, he would have got some sort of a pension and disability money. And it would have helped him the rest of his life, but he wanted to go home so bad he said he was well. But he, he always kind of had breathing problems, so Mama always helped him all she could, and I did too. I was always, I was the oldest and the daddy's girl, and just um, anything that daddy did, why, I was a tomboy and I got run out and did it. Uh, the cows and the, we always had a couple of old cows and milked one. One time uh, there was a rodeo. I was eight years old and the cars all parked and the cars made the circle for the rodeo. And my uncle was a pretty good um, bull rider and so he come out on the first bull and we was all parked around and cheering him on and some of them was honking horns and and uh, he rode the bull and then he jumped off and that bull was mad he didn't see where he was supposed to go and between our car and another car there was a little wider space and that bull was coming right towards it and uh, I'd help Daddy in the barn. I knew what to do. I jumped out there and waved and yelled, and that the crowd got quiet, and the bull turned and went the other way. And everybody knew that I was that bull rider's niece. And uh, they had some pens where they went across the river. They kept the stagecoach crossed there. It was the main traveled road east and west and it went through part of my grandpa's ranch. And um, up at the top of the hill, my grandmother one time, she was sitting at her desk and she saw a line of Indians slipping along through the trees from one tree to another tree. And she told the teacher and the teacher said, all right, you all sit here and be real quiet and be still and said, don't, uh, don't do anything different and do just what they say. But the Indians never did stop them. The Indians went on. But then my the man that sold it to my grandfather, he was riding on his ranch, and there was some Indians that lived down next to the river, camped down there and stayed all the time. And they shot him in the back. I don't know if they thought they killed him or what, but he pulled it out and it made him so mad he went down there and made them all move. But, uh, and then the last Indian raid, they came, there was a little mountain on the other side of the Brazos, and uh, the Indians made a stand there at Barber Mountain, and the... Um, whites had better guns and the whites killed them all but one and he was running and they let him go they thought he'd get back to Oklahoma and tell the other Indians not to come maybe but the whites did not bury the Indians they just didn't think they were human Now that was, it wasn't very, so very long ago when you think about my grandmother and, and 
them living there and a man lived there at that crossing and he had a boat and you could go and ring the bell and he'd come down there and he had a, a rope, I guess, going across and he'd pull it and you'd he'd ferry you over there and back for a little bit of money. And one of my grandpa's little brothers they had they were ferried over there and gonna visit somebody at that ranch.